Welcome to my sewing room. I have as a very special guest today, Kelly Latre. Kelly is National Education Director for Baby Lock, and she has brought some wonderful things to share with you. This little dress has an absolutely beautiful wing needle entredeau that comes down the front of the pretty little puffing. This is one of my very favorite dresses. Let me just show you something cute. See the tiny little embroidery designs that are just scattered over the front? When I looked at this at first, I thought, well, someone has done hand embroidery. And the back, if I can turn it over, is just as sweet as the front. Just tiny, tiny little miniature designs, and they're scattered all over the skirt also. This is a really, really elegant blouse with the cut work. Let me put my hand under it so you can see the beautiful quality of the cut work that's done on the corners. Once again, sewing for women is so very popular now. Then this is a beautiful uh, nightgown with just the pretty tucks and the heirloom look coming down the front and then a few more tucks down on the skirt also. You know, I just love using the idea. Now this is not a purchased blouse. This is a handmade blouse, but do you see how if you purchased a blouse, you could also just put these little delicate embroideries on the collar and then traveling down to the uh, pocket, the top of the pocket, another beautiful handwork. And there also are three double needle pin tucks embellishing this. The shoulders, let's come back. Let me just turn it around. That'll be a good idea. This is a perfectly wonderful tailored trim. It's just double needle pin tucks placed really closely to each other. And once again, the Australian blouse, which comes in up to size 28, I might add. Now, I bet when you look at this, you think, well, Martha has purchased some lace motifs from Switzerland and, and zigzagged them down. Not so. Kelly is going to show you today because this show is all about lace making on the sewing machine. These were made by machine. I might add that the motifs on my purchase suit were also made by machine. We're going to show you how. Come along with me to the technique boards. Would you like to make a lace collar on your sewing machine similar to the one I have on? Well, we're going to share with you just exactly how it's done. And by the way, it's easy. First of all, we're working on organdy, and you're going to take the designs, design 33, 34, 35, and 36, and place the center placements. Then, of course, using mirror image to go on the other side, you'll have to come over and do the same thing and get the mirror image placements. Then, as Kelly's going to share with you in just a few minutes, you're going to play, do design 33, and then you're going to center the others up. And when you finish your collar, your beautiful lace motif collar will look like this. And I have my friend Kelly Latre with us today as my very special guest. Kelly is National Education Director for Baby Lock, and Kelly has brought some beautiful things to share with you. Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. Will you let me just show this one blouse oh, before you... Sure. I just think this is so wonderful, almost as wonderful as these pieces I have on my suit. This is a beautiful lace collar made completely on the sewing machine and I'm going to hush now Kelly and let you tell us how to do this. <laughs> Thanks Martha. It's so good to be here. Today we're working with the lace card. As you can see on the cover of the lace card there's different motifs and today we're working with the motifs that make up the lace collar. Now it is important to pick out the proper thread and fabric for this project. You'll want to use lightweight silk or cotton embroidery thread and a very lightweight sheer fabric such as organdy. And the first thing I'm going to do is mark my fabric and I'm using a template that comes with the card and I'm going to place my piece of organdy over it and right here all I'm doing is marking the centers of each of the motifs and then so my memory doesn't fail me, I'm going to put the number of each motif. To do the opposite side, all you want to do is flip the template over and do the same marking. And the only difference I do is I just mark MI so that I know I'm going to mirror image those designs. Well, that little template certainly makes it easy, doesn't it? Isn't that great? Yeah. Very nice. 
The first thing you'll want to do is hoop the first center mark squarely in your hoop. And then you just embroider that section. And as you can see on my last sample, what I'm going to show you is it's very important to make sure the center mark is squared in the hoop before sewing it out. You'll want to rehoop for each section. And what I'm going to do is just use the template that comes with the hoop and make sure when I hoop this that is squarely in the hoop. Oh. It's as easy as that. You pop it in there, and then you can check the placement with the grid. And then, of course, you take the plastic out, take the grid yes. out. Yes, then you just can lift the just grid. Oh, wow. And that's it. Is that easy or Very what? easy. And then you just put it in the machine and press a button, and you're ready to go. You bet. I'll tell you what, that's the kind of sewing I like. Now, then, this is one that you have finished on that collar. Here, let me hold that for you. Oh, thank you. While you move just that. get that away. Now, you can lay that one down there and let everybody see that one that's finished after you've done all of the... Uh, imaging and mirror imaging and, and stitching. Then what you do is just simply cut out the collar using applique shears. And you know what? Then you will have a collar that looks like this. You've got to make a left and you have to make a right. And I have used this wonderful sticky, this magic sticky, Kelly, because I think I'm going to have to use my own machine to make my own. Kelly might take these home with her. <laughs> but anyway, isn't this a lovely way to embellish a purchased suit? And once again, Kelly, this collar right here is absolutely elegant. It, it looks like one of these turn of the century pieces that I show up in my attic. And I'm going to turn around to show you how elegant the back is too and very easy to make blouse and how pretty the collar is that goes from the front to the back. And now then, Kelly has brought for you a really beautiful home decorating project using motifs. It's a pillow. Kelly has made the most beautiful pillow for you. Now first, Kelly, I would like to show that this beautiful lace edging here, which really would be an eyelet or a Swiss edging, you did on the machine also. Then the reverse shadow applique. Isn't that beautiful with the leaves and, and on this, the white leaves on the blue fabric? This just looks like it was very difficult to do, and Kelly, I know it was not, so I'm going <laughs> to ask you to share with us about reverse shadow applique. I would be happy to, Martha. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is take the motifs from the lace card again, card number 29. And as you can see, there is also a guide sheet included for those. So the first thing you want to do is sew out two sets. One regular and then one a mirror image of all three designs. Then we're just going to trim them and I'm going to take one of the smaller ones here to show you how to trim these with an applique shears. What you'll want to do is just trim closely around the outside stitching. Very simple. Do you think it's easier with applique shears? Yes, most okay. definitely. Okay. It prevents you from cutting into those threads and makes it go a little bit faster. So I'm just going to continue on getting real close into those corners. And I think you've already got one of those cut out. And you bet. And you're going to show us how to do the whole thing on that pretty pillow. All right. So once you have the motifs trimmed, what you can then do is place them. Now, I use the guide sheet from the card. And as you can see, the guide sheet has the centers marked and the number of the design. And then I'm going to just pin them on the top and use a very lightweight stabilizer to applique them to the fabric. And you can see here on my last sample, I have it appliqued. Let me show you how to do this. And then later, we're going to trim off the fabric that's underneath the motif. So we'll set this aside for a minute and go to the machine. And I am using a zigzag real simple setup and I'm going to start on the bottom of my motif I'm going to use a zigzag setup on one width and a one length 
Now, is that a special foot or will it just any foot do? Yes, actually I'm using the open toe embroidery foot you that makes see. it very <laughs> easy to see. And I have a center mark right in the back. So I can just line up that center mark with that outside edge and go. Now I want to watch you turn those corners too. And then I'm just going to okay. gently curve And I'm going to have the needle on the inside swing so I can come around this curve. Is that important when you come around a curve, have it on the inside or the outside, depending on the way it's curved? It'll make the applique stitch just look a little smoother. Okay, and then I'm just going to turn it around on the point and come back down. I think slow and careful is what I think. Yes. It's what I believe may be one of the keys here. Is that correct? And it, so you can move it when you need to. You bet. And then I'm down at the corner again, so I'm just going to gently, and always guide side to side when you're doing applique. You don't want to push or pull the fabric. Take a little extra step there so I can. And needle down position too. <laughs> Absolutely. If you have needle down position. You bet. And this machine, as you can see, does stop down, which is real convenient. You know, these motifs could be done not only on something you're making, like this pillow, but they could also be used on, on uh, purchase clothes. Oh, yes. I think a lot of people are enjoying doing that because of the time factor that all of us face. Just enjoying these machines for fun and stress relief and relaxation, as well as making beautiful things. You bet. It's such an easy way to go to add motifs to an already purchased sheet or pillow. Yeah, home decorating is, is a lot of fun. And we're here at the top. Now, Kelly, I would love to see how you how you cut away from behind it. I know after you go oh, all the way around there, show us how you do that cut away from behind. Okay, Martha, I'll take the sample that I had on the board and show you how to just tear off, simply tear off the stabilizer. And then we'll trim the inside of the motif. I'm just going to grab onto this stuff in the inside. And the first thing you'll want to do is separate it from the bottom motif. I call that the pull and pinch method. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martha. Yes, we're pulling and pinching. And I'm just going to trim a little bit out so I can get started. And then I'm just going to continue by trim trimming very close to the stitching with my applique shears. Very closely and very carefully, I might add. <laughs> yes. Those applique shears really do help, though, in not cutting, the, being able to push it back, I think, don't you? It makes it very easy. And not cutting the fabric. And then after you finish trimming, of course, you're going to come, come back in, and we'll be able to see through. Now, Kelly, it looks to me like we have a white lining under this. Is that correct? Yes. On this pillow? Okay, we have a white lining on this pillow, and you see after Kelly has trimmed from behind, isn't that pretty? You have your blue pillow and your white lining. And Kelly, another thing, if you'll just let me share this. This is a wonderful placemat that Kelly has brought. You see, she's taken just one motif in the corner of the placemat, done exactly what you've done, and cut it away. And then once again, there's a handkerchief to, oh, excuse me, a napkin to match. I don't think we need a handkerchief to match a placemat. Now, Kelly, I thank you for letting me wear these beautiful motifs. And I, I guess I'll have to give them, but I can make one on my machine too, can I? Very easy. And now we have a silk ribbon technique for you. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today, Beverly Sheldrick from New Zealand. Beverly is the author of a beautiful book on embroidery called Colonial Inspirations. She is also frequently a guest contributor to both So Beautiful and Fancy Work magazines. Beverly, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. 
Martha, today I'm going to be just talking about these little branches that we have up here and the treatment that I've given to the stems for this particular subject. Now, the problem I had was this. I had the stems were done in a two millimetre ribbon, which was a very pale colour, but my leaves were quite a sharp green. So I was looking for a way to break that colour gap. And this is what I came up with. And I think it's really very simple. You will see here that I've just got a, the straight piece of this ribbon here. I've then put this, I've taken a very sharp green thread. In fact, I love this colour. I call it screaming green because it's <laughs> such a screaming colour. But it's very, very effective. And all I've done on this straight stitch is just taken a little back stitch like that and up to there. You can see the difference between this very soft colour here, putting the darker colour on it there, and it has much more intensity. So it really is a, just a, a little way of doing it. The other beauty, of course, of taking the little straight stitch along here like that is you don't have a long cord that could pull and um, disappear on you. Now, here we have these, these branches, and it's simply just a slightly tortured feather stitch. And you can just do anything you like with them. Make them go the way that you want to. So the arm of the feather stitch is very small. The length of this is quite long. And you can make them go any way you like. If, they, if you want them to, you can have them going that way, and you can curve them also and make them go round like that. But it's just so easy to do and yet can be just so effective when you see it like that. You know Beverly that did look very easy and you, let me ask you a question. When you're designing do you always draw something down first or do you just simply go in and put your branches where you want to put them? T tell me how you well, do that. Well I very rarely put anything in to start okay. with. Often if it's a big design like the one that we have here, then I'll put in just a few circles for those, those main flowers and fluff from there. Okay. I think, so. I think it maybe is done both ways. I just wondered how you did it. <laughs> <laughs> and now then we have, a, we have a beautiful New Zealand blouse for you. We are really enjoying getting some creative uses of this wonderful New Zealand blouse pattern for the series. Before I show you the actual techniques, I want to show you how interesting the sleeves are. Do you see that it has pleats rather than gathers that hold in the fullness? Now, the special treatment for today is that we have shadowed a beautiful print in behind the white batiste. Now, then you can call this scallops, you can call it anything you want to, but we usually call this the French waterfall when these scallops are mirror images. Uh, opposite from each other. Can you see how pretty it is for the fabric to show through? The sleeves have that same beautiful treatment with the scalloped lace, the feather stitching up above it, and the fabric that peeks through the Swiss Batiste. Now, come on over here and let's see how easy it is. Now, you know my middle name is Easy, so we have to make everything easy. Okay, now you're going to be a little surprised when you see how bright the fabric is underneath this Batiste. But but to put a little bit of Ecri Batiste over it, see, it almost makes it antique -y. So the first thing we're going to do is draw off the scallops and the turnaround lace shaping lines, and then we'll have the fabric behind it. Next, we're going to shape the laces that will be curving the lace and mitering. Once again, you can see that's just a square piece or rectangular piece of fabric behind. Right up here, I'm getting ready to shape some more lace. Now then, after I have shaped the lace, I'm going to put a little bit of paper stabilizer. I'm going to put it for two reasons. I like to use stabilizer as the first reason. But secondly, after I do my zigzag on the top and zigzag on the bottom, I'm going to come in here and do that tiny little feather stitch so I can put one more little decorative embellishment. Now after I have, as you can see here, I've already shaped the laces. I have my stabilizer behind there and I have cut away 
I've cut away the fabric. After I've stitched the inside edge of the scalloped lace, I have cut away the fabric. To, now then it's scalloped and it looks like the French waterfall now, or I guess I should say the shadowed waterfall. Now when I come to the corner, of course, I'm going to turn around. And you, some of you might say, now how wide do you make that zigzag, Martha, when you zigzag those laces down? And I'm going to give you a rule of thumb. You make it as wide as it needs to be to cover the heading of the lace. Well, what is the heading of the lace? The heading of the lace are those little threads that run through the lace. You know the ones that I pull when I shape the lace? Well, that's the heading of the lace. And the length, I have this one on about a .5 stitch length, but you can even go all the way up to, well, maybe even up to a, a 1.0 stitch length in some cases. Now, you see how easy it is to stitch the other side of the lace down. Now on this one, you can see that I have zigzagged the inside, zigzagged the outside. I've cut away the excess flowered fabric. Now to make it peekaboo, I'm going to once again go behind here and I'm going to very carefully trim away the fabric from behind the lace and don't worry about those raw edges. They're not going anywhere. Believe me, they are tightly zigzagged. And after that, it's now time to go back. You remember I put the stabilizer behind there? Well, I'm going to do a tiny little pink feather stitch. And that just adds a little special touch, I think. A little feather stitching to go in the curves. And then, of course, I'm going to come in and my final step will be to remove that final layer of stabilizer. And of course, when I'm on television, I always can't find the stabilizer to pull it, but I believe we can now. And any kind of pull-away stabilizer you want to use is just fine. Okay, I have finished up. I have the Batiste over that brightly colored fabric, which really isn't brightly colored anymore. It's just antiqued. Two layers of zigzagging or wing needle entredoing. I have trimmed the fabric from behind, and I have a beautiful layer of feather stitching. And now I would like to invite you to come to my attic with me, where I promise you I have something very special. For those of you that love embroidery, I think you're going to be glad I brought this blouse along. Look at the exquisite embroidery on the front of this blouse. It has all kinds of flowers, daisies, and looks like a form of rose, but it also has lilies of the valley, and that's one of my favorite flowers. Can you see that there is embroidery in between the buttons? tiny little stitches, and there is hem stitching or wing needle entredeau as we call it today. Over on the sleeves, oh my goodness, just almost every kind of flower, and then a little inset, a kind of a peekaboo inset with a beautiful lace that's sort of a crocheted lace, and then the flowers and another little inset and lilies of the valley. As on so many of these beautiful older blouses. The back is just as pretty as the front. And what can I say? The back is as pretty as the front on this blouse. You can see the daisies with the little eyelets in the middle, the stems, the leaves. Once again, lilies of the valley. And by the way, the fabric on this blouse is a linen and it's, it's sort of a medium weight linen, not a real, real thin linen. Another feature that I think is pretty are the tucks that go down this each side in the back. They come down this way and then on the other side. And you know what? If I turn it back around, I'll show you. I forgot to mention the tucks on the front. There are release tucks over here on this side, about, oh, about a quarter of an inch wide. And then there are some tiny little pin tucks over here on this side that are, that are teeny tiny, probably a sixteenth of an inch wide. Oh my goodness, the details that we can recreate today, of course, with our wonderful embroidery machines. I just appreciate your coming and joining me in my sewing room today, and I'd like to invite you back next time.